Welcome, everybody, to another fantasy chat. We have the man, the myth, the legend, uh, Nicholas Ames. I've heard it pronounced Eames and Ames. Do you have a preference? I think it's technically Eames, even though it is spelled Ames. So okay. once uh, I did, when I was working in restaurants, somebody gave me a, like a restaurant review, a server review uh, that called Nicholas Earns the best server in Vancouver. <laughs> and so whenever I was like on the ball, my boss called me Earns from then on. And when I wasn't, he called me Eames. So. Oh, well, that's, that's a, <laughs> yeah. see, I just occasionally get greeny because I have an E at the end yeah. and people want to pronounce it pronounce it pronounce it and that's never uh that's one where i'm like no don't not greedy oh, i'm surprised <laughs> that happens yeah no. you have two fantasy books out both of which i have read and dearly loved kings of the wild sure. and bloody rose and they are both inspired by eras of music as you said uh 80s yeah. and nine or 70s and 80s perspectively and the yeah. third book going into the 90s is the plan so are we going to see a surgence of hip hop culture suddenly influence? How, how's the plan here going forward? Yeah, the plan is a lot of kind of like anti-establishment stuff. A lot of the stuff in the 90s, no matter what genre it was from, yeah. was just upset with the system, whether it was maybe maybe less so Pearl Jam, but a little bit. And then Rage Against the Machine, obviously, and uh, and then pretty much all of hip hop from the late yeah. 80s on. So, Well, I, I, okay. If we're going to talk music in the 90s, yeah. I'm a big Green Day fan. I know I'm basic, but <laughs> that's there yeah. as well. Um, yeah. And then you mentioned Rage Against the Machine, like half of my workout playlist right there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so how – what was like the – how did you get inspired with that? What what was the moment where you're like, I'm going to write books, and each book's going to be an era from music? Was that – how did that come about? Because it's odd. No offense. It's yeah. great, but it's odd. You know, I agree. Um, well, the the Kings of the Wild, my first book was the was the original one. I hadn't I had planned it to write it as a standalone originally, um, and I think I mean I've talked to you before briefly about the fact that Ready Player One kind of inspired me to to um, write a book about things that I was passionate about, and then also there's a part in that book where uh, the main character discovers this. Uh, cave or something. It has something to do with the Rush song, the Rush song 2112. So I started listening to that song, which is a 17-minute like opus uh, about like an intergalactic temple called Syrinx, which I named Ganelon's Axe after. Uh, that's shutting down music. So th that kind of stuff. Listening to to Rush and uh, just kind of I don't know the idea just popped in my head, and so I googled it and thought, oh, someone's done this. I can't wait to read this book, and no one had. So I was like, oh, I better get to it. So from then on, like I, people ask, what are you writing? I'm like, ah, this is something that I wouldn't like. With my first book, I would tell them all about it. But with the second book, with Kings of the Wild, at least, I was like, I got to keep this idea to myself because it's pretty great. And as long as I don't fuck it up, then uh, <laughs> hopefully it'll come off well. Uh, and then with the other two books, it was just kind of a natural progression. I didn't want to tell Kings of the Wild is about a you know band getting back together, and I'd be kind of doing the whole story a disservice, I think, if I dragged them out on further adventures. Um, at least that's what I said to my agents and publishers. So it seemed only natural to me to you know move progress that story and that world itself into the next generation, and mm -hmm. then into the generation after that. So it it only seems like it. Math dictates a problem here, though, where after you get to five books, you'll be up to oh, date. Yeah. So is no, there I'm a done. plan? I'm done. <laughs> You're done? Okay, okay. That's not we'll like, okay, see. we'll go I back. Mean, yeah, oof. I mean, after the 90s, it's hard. I mean, I mean, and I could be biased. I could just be not, uh, you know, maybe didn't have my ear to the ground, as it were. But I don't think the, you know, the first decade of this century was defined by music that you could be like, listen to it and go, oh, bam, that was then for sure it it, could be totally wrong, but. it's it's difficult to translate eminem and britney spears in the same way i imagine it's it's wouldn't yeah. <laughs> i think maybe maybe the internet or like all that kind of stuff uh, is kind of the, just diversified everything so everyone can get their own stuff no longer is it like this is what's being handed to you mm -hmm. which uh, was like what it was in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s so well, especially with hip hop in the 90s, it seems like that would be the easiest because there was such a limited selection. In the early 90s and late 80s, there was – you didn't have the subgenres and person – it was LL Cool J. You know, there was, there was the, you knew the 12, 15, 20 people that were yeah. rap at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And that's primarily what – for at least the third book I'm going to be drawing on because late 80s hip hop 
um, and early '90s was a bit more political. And mm-hmm. granted, those those they stayed political. The bands that that did it, like um, N.W.A. Yeah, N.W.A. Um, God, who I'm trying to think of the low end theory is their album. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, like but then late '90s you get Tupac and Biggie, which are not less not necessarily political but they're still telling you their stories yeah. uh, and it's still important music to draw on and obviously it's not going to be like you know it's not those aren't necessarily my stories to tell per se but uh, i'm going to try to throw as much inspiration from them as i can uh, okay. into the book yeah see I, now there's not just the music influences though you also litter just references to things you clearly love as well yeah. i was digging through your twitter because part of my job is stalking you now um Perfect. and i found you confirming that a line is inspired by dumb and dumber uh, yeah which i thought was absolutely great have you seen almost everything you kind of sprinkled in be found by fans or is there just treasure troves layered in that people need to go back and read 10 more times to find I feel that almost everyone has been found. Okay. Um, maybe, yeah. I think everyone has been found. I know one of the most subtle ones <laughs> is uh, in Bloody Rose, there's a Say Anything reference. Um, have yeah. you seen that movie at all? I have not seen Say Anything, unfortunately. Uh, no worries. It's, it's a Cameron Crowe movie, so the guy that did like Jerry Maguire and stuff like that, all about music, all about like feeling good. <laughs> Don't <What>? die mid-interview. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this tea is going down rough. Um, but say anything as a very famous scene where junk who's actually like holding the ghetto blaster on top of his head, uh, which yeah. is referenced in a lot of movies, but this is not that scene in the, in the movie he gets broken up with in his car and, uh, and the girl who gives him a pen basically, um, it is super awkward. And so I kind of mirrored that scene, um, in bloody Rose when Kira gives Tam a knife. Um, and it's pretty subtle and I tried to make it fit all the rest of the story, but some people get it. Most people do not, and that's fine because it's very subtle. <laughs> well, that's that's like the great like on, like I don't mean to gush here, but that's what's real enjoyable about reading what you've written is it's just it seems to have this just fun mentality, this philosophy of just yeah I enjoy this so I'm gonna put it in and let's go that way. But you never neglect the emotional punches. There's still I mean I've seen Bloody Rose bring creators I know to tears. I think mm-hmm. uh, Pura Ford posted today about how rereading yeah. it made me cry. And I'm si- I have not seen the balance struck that delicately before. Was that, did you take a lot of time to still, okay, now we need to pull back, get the emotional beats in? Like, what was the process there for developing both so healthily? Yeah. Um, I think, I think honestly, it just kind of came out because I... Sometimes, like, my favorite writer is Guy Gabriel K, who writes really, like, you know, beautiful, heart-wrenching stuff. And so I spent probably about 10 years trying to emulate him. So maybe that, like, helped me, uh, you know, helped me develop my skills in that way. And then when I finally started writing Kings of the Wild, I was just kind of using my own voice, um, trying to be, like, being funny. And uh, and so, yeah, I think it honestly comes relatively easy. I think my editors do sometimes step in and say – this part maybe is a bit too ridiculous if we could tone it down so that it doesn't undermine the uh, the emotional aspects of the book, which is very, very fair. A couple, especially <laughs> in Kings of the Wild, um, I, I fought and, and managed to keep a lot of the more um, the ridiculous moments in, almost all of them involving Moog. But uh, I, think, I think it works in the end. And yeah. It, yeah, it's rewarding. It's really nice to make people laugh, but it's obviously very rewarding to make them cry because... Guy Gabriel K made me cry, and that's why I wanted to be a writer. So <laughs> you want to hurt people? Yeah. That's <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tears sustain me. <laughs> well, that I mean, what you said there kind of fits into I think something I said in a review of either Kings of the Wild or Bloody Rose, where I was afraid going in that these books would suffer from the Marvel problem, the Marvel problem, where there's an emotional impact moment and it's undercut by humor. But you'd almost never do that. You let it take the beat to hit, uh, which. I, I hate that. Like, I can't watch a lot of Marvel movies now. I still like them, but I, I just, like, there's a scene where, like, Ragnarok happens. Like, spoiler warning for Thor Ragnarok. And by the way, guess from the title, it gets destroyed. It's Asgard. <laughs> um, and then it blows up, and then there's a joke. And I'm like, why did you have to do that? So I appreciate yeah. you not, because I hate that as, like, someone who's trying to enjoy the media. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. I, I uh, God, I've probably done it and just been curtailed by my editors thankfully um and i think editors are usually pretty good for that Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, because I know as a writer, you you have a joke and you're just like, I really want this joke to get in there no matter what. So sometimes it takes an editor to come with a firm hand and tell you not to. So you mentioned Guy Gavril K. Would you say that's your largest influence as a writer? Yeah, yeah, I would say so for sure. I mean, there's definitely – he was the first writer – like I had written a little bit before that, like – in high school and things like that but he when i was reading his books and i still remember there's an exact page of one of his books uh, lord of emperors where i read it and the whole book itself is about leaving a legacy and uh and art and what you leave behind um and what that says about you and so that reading that book and then reading how beautifully that book was written uh and how elegantly this one page was phrased and i was just like i want to be a writer by the end of this page uh, and i was able to tell him that one day uh, and so it was pretty. It was pretty cool. Obviously, there's writers like uh, like Joe Abercrombie and Scott Lynch who write maybe a bit more similar to me, who in the early 2000s were writing books that had humor in them. Whereas books before that, at least I mean, I hadn't read Terry Pratchett at the time. Um, but yeah, not a lot of books I read had humor in them. We were in the midst of the, the grim dark phase, and so reading some Joe Abercrombie and some Scott Lynch made me think, okay, maybe I can write a book that's funny. Yeah. It's it's funny. I'm a big fan of comedy from stand up to written to movies. Like I love it. And everyone you just mentioned and I'll throw in Dresden Files as well. The humors Mm -hmm. there are so different. I think that's Mm -hmm. very like in terms of writing humor, it's so intimate as an author in a way, which is a weird thing to describe humor with. But you your sense of humor is going to come through like in a movie. It's a collaborative process of things get changed when you write a book. It's going to be your humor, 100%. Yeah. yeah. So I try not to take too much offense when people say, this book is juvenile. Was it written by a <laughs> 10-year-old boy? And I'm like, first of all, if you think 10-year-old boys and 40-year-old boys have a different sense of humor, then let me introduce you to mankind. We don't. I don't yeah. know. Maybe some dudes, but not I. I still will cry laughing at Pineapple Express, so yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So you also seem to have a pretty large love of video games. Has that affected your writing as well, or are those pretty separate for you? Um, no, I would say so. I definitely go to video games as a font for creativity, whether it's um, maybe not necessarily writing, but character, costume, setting, uh, epicness. You know, like, God, I fought tooth and nail to get to keep those airships in the first book. Uh, there was an agent I had on the hook once uh, who we ended up kind of parting ways, but he just would not let me put these airships in. Um, I feel like, God, I feel bad because I, sometimes I mention this and I feel bad dragging him about it. Uh, even though I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to say his name or anything, but he wanted me to change them to giant Eagles. And, and that I think maybe was the thing that drove the wedge, the final wedge between us. Maybe he like my writing too, but, uh, I was just like, I can't do it. And he's like, it seems too steampunk. I'm like, it's final fantasy. I don't know what to tell you. Airships. <laughs> um, um, I think they were great. Didn't pull me out at all. I won't dig into the agent, but he's wrong. Uh, yeah. The airships were. Yeah. But and I, and I, there is a lot of obviously video game references in there. I mean, a lot of homages to Final Fantasy, whether it's the airships, whether it's summoning, um, whether it's a turtle with a knife in one hand and a lamp in the other that's in Bloody Rose. Um, and then there's a video game reference I get burned for constantly, which is the cake is a lie from Kings of the wild. Um, which, yeah, some people just fucking hate it so much. And what can I say? It's there. I mean, the first time I heard that reference was actually in dragon age, not in portal. Um, mm-hmm. Sten says it when he's in a cave or cage. Um, I haven't played portal. So unfortunately I only know it from dragon age. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. I mean, hey, I've played like Portal 2, but anyways, um, yeah, ultimately the video game references are kind of there to make someone reading it, which is like kind of like when I read Ready Player One, mm-hmm. um, say just, yeah, it does snap them out of the book. I recognize that. And so I try not to you know, hammer it home too much, but it's there just to say, okay, this writer and I share the love of something. If you've gotten that reference, you obviously love video games. Um, and I'm okay with snapping someone out of the book if it means endearing them to me in a little small way and then they can get back into it. Okay. I know maybe it's not the not a wise thing to do, but hey, it doesn't snap me out too harshly. But I have to now ask the follow up question of mm-hmm. what are your favorite games, the ones you feel you've pulled from the most? Is there any that are just near and dear to your heart? I've echoed several times that Diablo Two is like my go to game. Yeah. Is there any for you that are like that? Uh, Final Fantasy 
is definitely okay. the biggest one by far. Um, okay. And then, I mean, I love games like, oh, Mass Effect. God, yeah. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that. And especially because um, it's obviously a very, very different setting, but the characters. And in Mass Effect, you get to know those characters. I, I at least dive deep into every single conversation I can possibly do. Mm-hmm. And so getting feeling getting that bond definitely inspires me. So I assume you're meaning Mass Effect 1 and 2 and kind of 3 and then not Andromeda. <laughs> you know what? Yeah, I bought Andromeda. I never did play it. I've heard good things from some people, but the, all the stuff turned me off it. Did you play it? I I think it is the biggest down step in a franchise I've seen, yeah. uh, like in video games. It was rough. Uh, granted, I've heard they've patched it. They've made it a lot better. I've heard it plays better. Mm-hmm. I played it opening like release weekend and was so disappointed mm-hmm. I have not picked it up since. Yeah. Well, what kind of like turns me off about it I should, is 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 the characters. So, like even if you didn't play Mass Effect, you see those characters everywhere. Every yeah. people love them, and you see drawings of them, cosplay of them, uh, and I couldn't tell you or say what a single character from Mass or from Andromeda looks like because they just they obviously haven't captured people the same way. So that is kind of what puts it on the back burner. Well, it's it's personality and creativity, right? Like they they put there was clearly love going into the design of all these people. It really comes through strongly, and I just didn't get that same passion in Andromeda. Uh, yeah. It just felt very cookie cutter. It felt like the world is built, so let's just put out whatever we already can instead of building anything new yeah it was disappointing it was not great and then for book three i actually played um horizon zero dawn for a little bit of inspiration okay because it might involve some golems um (laughs) some golem action and you know that game has you know mechanized dinosaur type things so the, that's one of the games that I again I played for like five minutes and I was like this is great I can appreciate it not my mm-hmm. genre unfortunately yeah I played it for a little bit and then I put it down for like a year and then I picked it up again and blew through the rest of it like mm-hmm. once it really got me it really it really got me its storyline is ludicrously good is your love of games like a lifelong thing have you been playing since you were Pretty much. As soon as I, right when, unfortunately, right as my uh, posture was forming when I was 13 years old, I (laughs) discovered Nintendo. So, yeah, now I have the posture of a crone, but what an imagination. That's we mentioned Nintendo. I find Hyrule to be one of the most addictive fantasy worlds to go back to. It's so formulaic and repetitive, but great. Oh, yeah. Ganondorf did something. The princess is in trouble, or kind of not, and you're gonna fight him. It's the yeah. same formula every time, but it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I actually haven't played the latest one only because I don't have a Switch, but I I. I dove in and bought a Switch, played it for like six months, sold it, and then like a month later, I was like, why did I do that? I need that. So I got a Switch again and have been playing pretty much religiously since. It's such like gaming is so like competitive a lot of the times, and I occasionally just need a break. I need something that's low energy. So then I start playing uh, Mario Kart, and I I say, forget that. I need to murder whoever I'm playing against, (laughs) and then let it go. I think I probably will get another one. I bought one for my brother, and I borrowed it to play. I mean, I saw I bought it knowing that Fire Emblem was going to come out for it, so I borrowed it and played that. Um, and then there's something else coming out that I saw. There's a sequel to this game, this really obscure game called Brigandine, mm-hmm. uh, that was a PS2 game that nobody knows of, but to me it was one of the greatest games ever made. Um, it was like a tactical RPG, and uh, anyways, there's a sequel to it coming out only for Switch, so... Well, if you're into fantasy games, the selection on Switch is fairly impressive, um, and mm-hmm. a few exclusives there that are really great. If you haven't played Hollow Knight, recommend it. They also have Witcher on there now, Skyrim, of course, because Skyrim yeah. is on every platform. Yeah. Uh, that's actually what, something I've really been impressed with, is they have a, uh, a quite thriving fantasy selection, which yeah, cool. Nintendo has never really Xenoblade done that. And Chronicles before. is getting a remake, too, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think that's yeah. yeah, that's right. That's coming out as well. Yeah. Um, so what we're what I've learned here is that your influences are just across the board nerd culture. <laughs> Pretty much, music, okay. movies, games, you name it. Anime, too. Yeah, so, Dungeons and Dragons, just all the nerd stuff. That was where I was going to go next. I mean you pretty much can't see a review of your books online without someone mentioning the D&D comparison. Is that something you intentionally tried to put in, or is that just kind of a surprise to you to see that comparison so consistently? Yeah. Oh, no, definitely. I mean, it was... Because I I played so much... I played a lot of D&D as a kid, um, and 
I just loved it. And then for years, it seemed um, obviously there's like the camaraderie aspect and the joking aspect. I mean, sometimes you'll like I've played D and D a couple times before with people that are very very serious about it, and it is not enjoyable. And <laughs> when you yeah. play it with friends, like when I play D and D with my friends, when someone rolls a twenty, I've got this M and M like a toy M and M guy. You pull his arm, and M and M's come out. So when someone <laughs> rolls a twenty, you pull the M and M guy's arm, and then when never someone rolls one, you. Uh, you have there's we have this bottle of famous grouse scotch and uh you have to swig from that so there's so there's reward sometimes you got a mouthful of m ms exactly so we obviously make it fun so that that aspect was put in there and then um just with the monsters like all the books i was reading at the time uh you couldn't write a book i wouldn't have read a book with like goblins in it when i was 30 years old. I just wouldn't have. I was way too cool for that, I thought. Um, and I certainly wasn't trying to write it. Um, and so I think fantasy kind of got away from that kind of the, it's, its old school roots kind of thing. Uh, and so Kings of the Wild was just kind of a love letter to that, like putting that kind of stuff back in there. So I, if it was, yeah, I threw everything in the kitchen sink monster wise in there. It, I mean, that's the, one of the, I think it's the only book i've read uh, that has a uh an eagle bear owl, owl bear sorry an owl bear yes. in it, which is a yeah. very obscure uh creature to pull from and yeah. it's presented as such i mean it's talked about as this rare you know we'll only come across it every now and then type of creature which yeah. i was like wow not only, only is it here but it's presented correctly <laughs> yeah Perfect. Well, I'm glad. Yeah, that people obviously love that owl bear. There's a few other really obscure ones in Kings of the Wild. There's a, a thing called an Edder Cap, uh, and I think I call it that. And that, I used to use that in every single one of my D and D campaigns. Whenever I'd play with my brother, he would always be this guy. People would meet in the woods, and whatever he said was like an, a lie, uh, which is exactly what happens in the book. He like points in one direction, and then they go the other, and he attacks. So there's a lot of like small, small D and D nods that only my brother will get. So are you typically the DM, or are you like to create characters and actually play? Yeah, usually the DM. Usually uh, the DM. Once in a while, I'll be the yeah. Once in a while, I'll be the player, and I love doing that just because it's relaxing. But yeah, I like to be the DM. Every author I've asked has said they were the DM, which I guess is predictable. But <laughs> yeah, because you end up making up those making up stories, and you, maybe you feel like you want to have a bit more control yourself over the how things go. So you said you kind of are more relaxed, not the super stringent rule-based DM, you know, first and foremost, have fun. Do you have, like, longer campaigns, or are you guys starting fresh every few months? Because it's, I see, like, there's two groups. There's either people who play one character for 40 years, or it's yeah. every six months you just restart, or even quicker. Yeah. I actually haven't played it in a long time. I played it, the last time I played it was about a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, a few, about five or six years ago, when I lived in Vancouver, I had a a bunch of guys at work that would play it with us. Um, and so they would come over every single Sunday and we, we had like probably a year almost of every single Sundays. It was pretty great. Um, and then now it's just once a year, me and a couple guys get together and do it. I would love to play it more, but I just kind of live in a place where it's pretty remote. Only my brother lives here, but it would just be the two of us. Yeah. And those online yeah. websites that are like, you can play and it does not the same. It's playing yeah. over. It's, you need to be in a room and stay in that room until everyone's smelly and gross. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Six boxes of pizza in the corner and empty <laughs> liters of soda. Yeah. If everyone hasn't got their own M&M &M guy to, ha to pull his hand, then what's the point? <laughs> yeah. I love it. Um, yeah, it's, it's funny how, I don't know, like there's, in terms of like love of fantasy, it seems to me that there's a pretty consistent, uh, like you know, you're able to joke about it. You're like, but there's also respect for the genre, like that people who are willing to write usually end up having, where it's like, yes, I can make jokes, I can have fun with it, but you know, you like you said, you'll read Guy Gavril K and be so moved it makes you want to be a writer. Like there's there's mm -hmm. the duality there where it's like, yeah, it's not serious, but I love it and it's a formative part of my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's only way I know how to write now. Ultimately, is just I, I like. Sammy sounds corny to say you stay true to yourself, but uh, maybe you've got different characters that you know are outlets for humor. Like obviously, in the first book, Moog. If I wanted to have a joke and it was seemed ridiculous, I could just have Moog say it. Uh, the same went for Roderick in in uh, the second book, and then I have a character named Short Knife in the third that uh, will be that same. If there's a joke that I'm like, oh, this might not fly, I'll just let him say it, and hopefully it will. So you, you write in a little a cop-out character who you can just slip in. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. 
Um, so I, I find that. So again, getting back to the humor here, mm-hmm. you're willing to go to these places that, you know, I'm not in like a daredevil way, but you're taking jokes in ways that a lot of fancy authors won't because they don't want to have, you know, a fourth wall break type moment. Mm-hmm. Did you, sitting down to write Kings of the Wild, you had this, okay, I'm going to do music, I'm going to have references inspired by Ready Player One. And what were like the first few pages writing like? Like, were you just immediately hitting this vibe, this tone you were on, or did it take a long time to develop the, okay, this is the tone of Kings of the Wild? Um, not at all, actually. The first three chapters of the book I just wrote probably in like a week. It just came right out. Um, th- to be honest, in all the editing that ever happened, almost no editing happened in those first three chapters. Um, they were just almost like untouched um, by anyone. And I put them aside for a year and went and wrote my went back to my old book that I was trying to get published. Um, and I was like, okay, this feels pretty good. And then I went back and um, by the time I came back, um, yeah, I just picked up the story and it just went. Kings of the Wild just really came out of me pretty quickly. That's yeah. impressive. That's not the answer I expected, to be honest, because it's not the one I typically hear. <laughs> yeah, Bloody Rose is a lot harder to write um, mm. just because maybe you're trying to strike a balance. And I think the third one's even harder because times the times get darker and it's not like the 70s was like a really happy-go-lucky time for music. The way bands acted, it was a bit less destructive. Yeah. Um, and more wholesome. They were about each other and about their families. And then in the eighties when bloody Rose came along, it was, there was a lot of bands that were about addiction and about self-destruction and like guns and roses, you get the real guns and roses, forgive me, Axel, <laughs> um, you know, they were around for like something like four years and not even like, it was just, they had like, bam, they were just like, like a flare and went out. Um, and so I was trying to capture that. So when you're trying to capture darker things like addiction and yeah, and that kind of stuff. It's harder to make a to make those characters endearing and to pull off humor. Um, and the same goes for the third book. When you're talking about people that are anti-establishment, they're obviously anti-establishment because they're unhappy. And yeah. so it's a fine balance between. Ultimately, you, get, you just want to tell your story that's important to your world and your characters. Um, but if you're trying to make it emulate the music of that time, then I think it can be a little difficult to weave humor in. So hopefully, I I managed to do it. It's it's. You know, 90s became much more angry, I feel like you could just say blanketly, especially in hip-hop and rock. I mean, there was much more just, yeah, it's anti-establishment, but it feels like it's coming from a more, and not to insinuate these people were violent, but it's coming from a more violent place of, they mm-hmm. will directly say, F you, F you. Like, yeah. it's a very direct message of, we hate this, we're upset, and things need to change. Yeah. Uh, in a way that was so direct, like, that hadn't been seen before, I feel like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's difficult, but ultimately it's just once you make your characters and you just um, like I said, making someone like Moog or making someone like Roderick, if you've got a funny character in there um, and other characters that with funny personality traits, then I think that humor will surface and help keep the story light, lighter, uh, and at least give some some moments of levity uh, amongst whatever the hell else you throw at them. Yeah. Uh- you know, I, I, I can say from a fan's perspective, you're working with tone seems to work out so far. Uh, I appreciate it. <laughs> maybe just don't dive into like the super goth, uh, you know, yeah. life is pointless. Yeah. Everything's terrible. That came about in the 90s a little bit. Um, yeah. I doubt, I don't think we'll have a Marilyn Manson stand in, you know. <laughs> Probably not. I'd like to try to poke, a, poke, a, poke some fun at boy bands, but we'll see if I can get that in there. That, that fits. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that seems like it would line up. Um, so yeah, it's it's a, it's a fascinating evolution there for music to lead into a story and then grow from that into Kings of the Wild, Bloody Rose. And I'm sorry, do we have a, na- a name for the third book? Yeah, Outlaw Empire is the third one. Oh, okay. I thought that was the name of the series. So the series is just still the no. band. Yeah, the series is still the band. Outlaw I, Empire is the name of the third book. I had it in my head that Outlaw Empire was the new title of the series, but... I was wrong. Oh, okay. No, it was, uh, I mean, I think I was supposed to keep it under wraps, but somehow it got out. It was on like Goodreads, um, but that's fine. It's not like a huge deal whatsoever. And I mean, I know there's, once you, there's, there's always the red tape, but once it's cut, I never understand when people are like, it's out there. We have to try and stop it. No, once it's on the internet, it's on the internet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've managed to keep the cover under wraps, so that's at least something. I, dude, whoever your cover artist is, hats off to him. <laughs> yeah, Richard Anderson. He's He was my favorite cover artist before all this. Um, I played the shit out of Guild Wars 2, 
which he does. He's one of the main uh, designers for. Oh, okay. um, so it looks all the character designs look like his artwork. Um, and then I just kept buying books like uh, Brian Staveley's series um, that have his covers and not realizing. I was like, there's something all these have in common. And then one day I was like, oh, yeah, same artist. And then I think when I my editor who I my first editor who I love dearly, she went like looked at my Instagram, saw that I love his covers. And at the time we were going back and forth over the title of the book. And I think she knew I wasn't going to get my way. So she went and got asked the cover people to get Richard Anderson for me. So, wow. yeah, it was, cool. I was the day I found out he was going to be do my covers. Um, I was almost as happy as the day I found out I was getting published. Cause I can be really, really nitpicky about fantasy covers, like super critical about them. Yeah, I have my own strong opinions there. I'm so tired of Guy with Sword. We we need to move on from Guy with Sword. <laughs> I know. And I used to actually, like, I used to always prefer, because in Canada we kind of get a mix of both. Usually we used to get the UK covers. Mm. Now it seems we usually get the US ones. Um, and the UK covers are usually a bit more mellow. They've got, like, you know, like, especially for something like Steven Erickson. I could not believe when I first saw the US Steven Erickson covers. I was like, what are these? Uh in the in the U in Canada in the UK we have these like uh, you know they're like scapes like castles and and like mm. blasted you know canyons uh, with maybe like a lone figure and then I looked at the US ones and it's guy with sword it's straight yeah. up guy with sword so the UK um, ones tend to be more David Attenborough got it <laughs> yeah and then but recently I don't know Orbit's been knocking out of the park with covers and daily yeah, I found myself really enjoying um, US covers I love like I love them now. But as someone who has spent their entire life trying to get non-fantasy readers to read fantasy books, um, I like it when a book has a cover that doesn't shoot itself in the foot to non-fantasy readers. Um, you know, if I think if Name of the Wind, Name of the Wind is obviously a phenomenal book, but if it had a dude with a sword on the cover, I don't think it would sell as well as it does because you'd have a hard time. You couldn't convince your mom to read it, your uncle to read it if they don't like fantasy. Yeah, I mean, the genre... It, for decades, seemed to just be either the covers are imitate Tolkien or here's your party on the front looking yeah. fantastical. And it was such a lack of artistic diversity. And yeah, you're right. Orbit especially has suddenly just had this explosion of, mm -hmm. I mean, the Poppy War covers look outstanding to me. I really like Beautiful. the, uh, yeah. yeah, gorgeous. Um, and I've also really enjoyed, I mean, okay, they're, they're technic, it's Guy with Gun, but I like the Powder Mage, but I don't believe it's Orbit. No, it is. I'm looking no, right now. Powder Mage is Orbit. Uh, yeah. Poppy War's not. They're, they're Harper Collins, I think. But, oh, uh, okay. yeah, Powder Mage are, is insane. And that's one of the rare cases where, um, it's got not only Guy with Gun, but it's like photorealistic person. But it works. And I'm also not, a, I mean, it'll happen to me eventually, I'm sure, if I'm lucky enough to obviously keep a career going, but, uh, I don't like photorealistic people on covers like i don't like it well i'm sure you'll agree with me here the worst covers are just the here's a snapshot from the movie and we lazily put it over <laughs> totally i hate those i get yeah. from a marketing perspective it probably works it's you know oh they saw the movie they see vigo mortensen they'll read lord of the rings finally mm -hmm. but yeah. i just i i will never proudly display those on my shelf yeah i think maybe that must be there and they must have they must have data that says that works uh, and it must be there to get those non-fantasy readers into it. You know, I'm sure when yeah. name of the wind gets made, it'll have a picture of Lynn Manuel Miranda on the cover or something like that. And off it'll go. Yeah. yeah. And More. I'm sure when the wheel of time books come out, I'll have a fifth whole collection uh, somewhere in my apartment. Kings of the exactly. wild, have the casting there, uh, which I'm sure. Oof, you, yeah. Here's open. I'm sure you're not allowed to speak on who you'd like to see or who, you're pulling for currently to play someone well i don't think it's like no one says not to but it's probably just you know not it maybe sucks because if you're if you're there going oh i can only i only want you know vigo mortison to play so and so then if he's not cast you're like hey you're cool too nikolai coster waldo um, <laughs> yeah but i mean when i jo jokingly when i wrote it i think i always had brad pitt in mind just in my head for gabe for golden gabe just because there's somebody that you know, had a glorious youth and can look good, but can look disheveled. Um, yeah. But I think I put up a, like a joke casting me and my brother did a while ago. And I had Nikolai Coster Waldo from uh, from Game of Thrones as Gabe, just because, you know, he, he can look like the White Knight, but then he can look rough. Yeah, he can. He proved that just in the Song of Ice and Fire, that's for sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, yeah. 
It's funny. I saw, I think I saw that tweet where you had, uh, and I also see the fans just have latched onto that as well. And now a lot of the fans who are talking about casting, they will just have, you know, Jamie Lannister is going to be a slow hand and that's what we want. Yeah. Um, so that's, Hey, if, it, if I can help it, I'll put it out there as well in the universe and try Perfect. to get that going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ultimately, if, I mean, if the movie gets made or some TV show gets made, um, whatever happens, I'll be happy with whoever. I don't care. I mean, Obviously, I'd like to, to – if Ganelon better be black, I'll tell you that. Because too many people are like, Jason Momoa for Ganelon. And I'm like, cool, cool, cool. No. no. <laughs> More of an Idris Elba vibe is what I've always kind of pictured. Exactly. exactly. I have this weird problem where I just put Idris Elba on a ton of characters, and I don't know why. Like Dark Tower for me, that's Idris Elba because of the movie, but also Dresden. Yeah. I don't know why. Yeah. I guess I saw him in the office, and he was like, I know the effect I have on women. And I'm like, me too, dude. God damn. Like, <laughs> yeah, and he's probably a little old for Ganelon. A lot of people have suggested Ricky Whittle, who is – I want to – he's from uh, – what's that? Uh, Neil Gaiman, The American Gods. Yeah. yeah. He's I've, pretty badass. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've also really, in my mind, always thought Kings of the Wild would be a phenomenal video game adaptation. I haven't yeah. seen you touch on that much, but is that something you'd also – I mean, of course, you'd be interested. Oh, I'd love in. that. Yeah. yeah, someone approached me a long time ago about maybe doing it, and then nothing came of it. Um, and then now the people that bought the film rights have the video game rights. So I mean, if someone wants to, they're more than welcome to it. Um, and I would love to, like, yeah, have a hand in that because somebody who loves video games, it would be it would be great to see. I yeah, I there's everyone always talks like this needs to be a show, this needs to be a movie, but I'm slowly turning into, I need more great fantasy games. I don't want Witcher and Skyrim to just be the yeah. face of fantasy for so long. Don't get me wrong, they're amazing, but yeah. there's tons of others that could be amazing games just because the magic systems lend themselves so well to it. Mm -hmm. And we see so often when you see a TV show or a movie and it's based on a book, it's just good. Like, not saying that you can't do it without it, but... Those like you know Game of Thrones when it was following the source material was phenomenal. Um, you have to add you know, that it was, <laughs> Yeah, it was phenomenal. Um, and so yeah, I think a game could be the same way if a game follows. I mean, I, I I actually haven't even read them, but I got a feeling the Powder Mage books would make phenomenal games. Yeah, uh, it might be a strange game mechanic to start snorting powder to get more powerful, um, mm -hmm. but it it worked. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. Or yeah, it just, there's tons of tons of books that would make great games. Yeah. Well, it's there's still the snobbery against gaming in some ways, right? Where people just would rather see the game, the TV show, or the TV show or the movie. And I'm I'm sitting here like now the mechanics of this really lend itself to a quick little you know wheel selection. Bam! I want to use that power and go. Yeah. 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 Have you done a video on what books would make great games yet? I need to. <laughs> That's what I'm sitting here thinking. Like, okay, I need to do mm -hmm. a top ten. Uh, these and it's also the story structure right like games yeah. can either be completely open world or a specific narrative path i like this i don't open world is done too much in my opinion which is a controversial yes. opinion i know but there's some games that just don't need to be um yeah. maybe maybe feel free to push back on this kings of the wild i would think that would be more of a let's just go down this narrative path toward uh type is yeah no i'd say yeah. that i'd yeah. love to see like an isometric i love like those isometric top-down rpgs um, yeah. so something like that would be kind of cool too if you had your main quest taking you here, here, and here, and here, and then side quests. And exactly. it doesn't even have to be, it doesn't even, it could be not, like, I've always said that about whether someone wanted to make a TV show about it, too. Like, you could take just the idea of it, the bands as rock stars, and you don't even have to follow the story of Kings of the Wild if you don't want to have that story. But I think it would make a great TV show in general to have that sort of mentality. And it would make a great game, like, just make your own band. And it certainly makes for a good. I played D and D with it once, and it's easy to get that campaign oh, yeah. started because you're like, you're a band. You know, there's no further. I, I see a lot of series have like, here's our D and D book, and I'm blown away that I haven't seen one for Kings of the Wild yet because it seems like it would just be the, oh, boom, done. We have the Kings of the Wild lit RPG book. <laughs> yeah, I mean, ultimately, you could just use. You could just use Dungeons and Dragons. It's so close to it, you know. Um, when I ran a campaign, I used I used Pathfinder actually, just because I didn't have the D and D books. Pathfinder's better, but um... <laughs> it's pretty great. I haven't played Fifth Edition, so I hear good things. Have you uh, Have you thought about what you'd want your author cameo to be if it's adapted to a show or movie? Do you want to be punched in the face by Slowhand or a goblin somewhere? Yeah, or maybe just one of the one of the one of the band guys at the in the when Gabe gives his big speech, who's just 
yell something, maybe a bard. Who knows? That's it. That'd be great. See, I, I've yeah. always had in my head, if I'm ever going to be in a movie or a TV show for any reason, I need to be punched in the face because I deserve it yeah. and it'll work. <laughs> yeah. Well, I told my dad I'd get him in there too if something like that ever happened. So. Has he been yeah. a big supporter from the beginning? Huge. I mean, both my parents um, obviously were supportive in not like I was a I was a server for a long, long time, and they never said get a real job. Um, they always kind of believed in me, so that was that was nice. And then neither one of them really read fantasy books, um, or my dad doesn't read books in general. Like I'm trying to get him on those sharp novels, um, but he just he's just so reluctant. Anyways, he's read Kings of the Wild. He's read Bloody Rose. So is my mom. My mom listens to the audiobook in her car on repeat. Like, it's just, you get in her car, Kings of the Wild audiobook is playing. <laughs> Always and forever. Um, Gotta and love mom. both of them, yeah, they've both been huge, huge, huge supporters. And my dad will hawk it to anyone he sees. Uh, he'll put posters up for it. My mom will make, like, she does like, a lot of geocaching. I don't know if you've heard of that, but she has mm-hmm. geocaching trails based around it. Um, she's got an all, all, like, shelf dedicated to to me at home with like she steals my translated copies and puts it on her shelf so yeah they've both been they've both been fantastic that's wonderful and i okay so you mentioned posters there is there kings of the wild posters because if so i need one immediately <laughs> yeah there has been there's uh, there's been a lot of merch i mean i've i'm out of the i left i took a big box up to toronto once uh, last year and left them there unfortunately um but they were cool they were double-sided and they had Kings of the Wild on one side, Bloody Rose on the other, and they weren't just the cover. They were the cover art, but the wording was at the bottom. I'll send you a picture of it later, because um, my books to my local bookstore has the two posters up in the bookstore, and consequently sells a lot of the books. Um, but yeah, there's been Kings of the Wild um, T-shirts made back when Bloody Rose came out. They made, which I can't find mine right now, but it's around here somewhere. Um, like with the like a band shirt with all the names of the arenas Rose and her band went to on the back, it was pretty wicked. It's funny how your own merch can just go missing to the point where like I don't I had a sweater for my channel it's gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I still have I've got there's book they made bookmarks that were like concert tickets which I still have and they did the audiobook codes and cassette tapes for Bloody Rose, um, which was pretty cool. I like I look forward to seeing what they do for the third one and the first one didn't get it obviously because it wasn't it was pretty under the radar but. They did. They went really above and beyond for the second one. See, now I never thought about how well the premise uh, that you did here works into merchandising, but it works into every bit of merchandising that bands have. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't know if I'm allowed to make stuff and sell stuff. I know my brother would just love it, but you get on that those Kings of the Wild T-shirts. Um, so I've also noticed you do have at least a few tweets about sci-fi books, sci-fi material. Would you say you're equally a sci-fi fan or is it more just okay i love fantasy and i like sci-fi yeah probably i like i love them both i just read a lot more fantasy in general um i don't i think fantasy has a tendency to be a bit more uh character driven than sci-fi yeah um the sci-fi i'm reading right now i'm reading alex um white's um the sequel to big ship at the edge of the universe, uh, mm-hmm. which it's very, it's like a Kings of the wild in space. It's like serenity. It's like everyone's on the ship, having heart to hearts, having sex with each other. And then they go on an <laughs> adventure. Um, whereas a lot of sci-fi, especially, you know, even the really good sci-fi, you look at like Adrian Tchaikovsky's uh, children of time or something like that. And granted it does have pretty good characters, but a lot of it's more concept based and it's, mm-hmm. it's more, or like the ancillary, ancillary justice, ancillary mercy. You're not like, rooting for those characters the same way you might but the stories and the writing are, are so good whenever someone's like oh tolkien's the driest thing i've ever read i'm like so you've never read asimov got it <laughs> yeah yeah so a lot of sci-fi not to knock it i mean it's it's fantastic um it just it can be a bit more high concept than fantasy it can be a bit more down in the dirt and i love it when sci-fi gets that way too well i I originally did kind of push back against how sci-fi is going more character based. I was kind of being that snob who was like, no, it must remain, but damn, some of it's so good. It's winning me over. And a lot of it is still really exploring these concepts in great ways. Um, And now we're seeing epic sci-fi in a way that we haven't before, as it's suddenly just Mm -hmm. looking at epic fantasy and going, we could do that. And then we have the expanse, which is, you know, I'm, I'm on book two right now and it's, this is, I normally hate when things on the cover are like, this is the equivalent of Game of Thrones. We're like, no, it it is the sci-fi equivalent of Game of Thrones. Good job. Yeah. Decent marketing there. Yeah. And Red Rising, too, are awesome, awesome books. I'm, I'm starting the second book of Red Rising now and quickly realizing how people were right when they said, trust me, continue with the second. 
<laughs> yeah, it's good. I've only I've only, I did the, them on audiobook, so I've heard the first two. Mm. I haven't. I've managed to avoid spoilers for book three, but I I don't know. It's been a little bit spoiled for me, but. Well, when you run in the circles, we run in spoilers just happen. Like it's, you know, whether you're on a panel or in an interview, someone's going to drop like, oh, Darth Vader's Luke's dad, the equivalent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking of like humorous books, have you read Orconomics yet? I have not. Okay. Well, do you ever do audiobooks? Uh, I'd say I'm about 50-50, which is higher than people okay. think. I like to yeah. I have a good balance. Yeah, because I listened to that on audiobook, uh, and I saw it getting a lot of comparisons to Kings of the Wild, uh, and it is friggin' amazing, and the sequel is even better. Uh, it's a bit more like more funny than me. It's more Terry Pratchett-esque, because it's like, uh, more, there's a lot more wit, and there's a lot more um, like uh, poking fun at the wit at society. Um, but yeah, it just eviscerates society sometimes. Yeah, well, and then they make great audiobooks. Okay, okay, see, I... Yeah. If you want to sell me on something, a Pratchett comparison is definitely a way to go. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's it's put, shoot a moonshot, you know? You're like, oh, it can only, it's just as good as Pratchett. I, whenever someone says it's just as good as Pratchett, I take it as when someone says, like, it's the new Lord of the Rings. I'll be like, it, okay, I get what you're saying. It's it's getting yeah. there. It's coming close. but Yeah, it's, no one does it's, Pratchett, but Pratchett. Yeah. It's so funny to me how if you think absurdism and fantasy, there there's Discworld, and then there's everything else. Um, exactly. It's it's just that monolith, and it's not. I mean, other things can do absurdism as well as Discworld, but it's just because it did it so well first that then mm -hmm. it's just going to be the face of that. Um, mm -hmm. And then you know, I've, I think I've I, don't, I forget how many Discworld books I've read now, but there's just so many you end up getting lost. There's no, you don't know what book you've read or what you haven't. You just get lost in this world of crazy, batshit, crazy, <laughs> absurd. Yeah. Uh, I love it. And it slowly gets a little political, I feel like. Some people disagree with me on that, but I definitely have moments where I'm like, that's commentary, I think. Oh, definitely. Yeah. There's tons of it. Yeah. I mean, I haven't read too much of it. The first Terry Pratchett book I ever read was I read Going Postal. Um, I read it after Kings of the Wild had been sold. I hadn't, like, read mm. any of it beforehand. Otherwise, I maybe would have tried writing a funny book early. But, um, <laughs> yeah, going postal. And then I read the first of all three of his, like, ma main series, except for Mort. I haven't read that one yet. But so I I, have you, have you, are you, you know, how – this is a question that's so cliche to ask people who write fantasy. But in terms of, mm -hmm. like, Tolkien, when did you first pick up Lord of the Rings? Is it a – you know, could you consider it a big influence? Like, how did you find, you know, Middle Earth? Yeah, no, I'm definitely one of those people who Tolkien was my gateway drug. Um, I was really young. Like when I started reading it, I was probably, I was way too young to grasp much of them. I used to skip over all the, all the, um, like descriptions of land. As soon as they started traveling, I was out. Um, and then a song, I skipped the songs. Um, but, but yeah, I loved them. And then I think, um, we may have talked about this before too, but like when I read the second book, the sequel, um, and at the end of it ends with Frodo was alive, but taken by the enemy. And I was just, I was like, What? Like, I had never read a book with a cliffhanger before. Um, and so it was, yeah, it meant the world to me. So I just kept moving on. First and then I read a lot of, like, R.A. Salvatore books in t as a teen. And as you, I feel like everyone had Salvatore in their teens. Like, he was the yeah. teenage Salvatore fantasy read. And then you go off into yeah. other things. It goes Tolkien, yeah. Salvatore, then wherever you go next. Yeah. I tried. I remember I, I, started, I read some... Um, Actually, funnily enough, Guy Gavriel K, I read him for a school project. I was very late on it. Uh, I had two days to turn it in, so I went to my book and looked. I had to read a Canadian author. So I looked at the spines, saw a book, uh, pulled it out, and it was book three of his Fiona of Our Tapestry. Hadn't read one and two. And I was like, all right, I got. I just got to get this project done. So I started reading it, and it's about people named uh, like Paul and Dave from Toronto taken into a fantasy world, which I thought was a fucking terrible idea. I was like, this is garbage uh and i kept reading it and then king arthur's in it and i was like oh my god this is <laughs> terrible and then got to a day later and i was bawling my eyes out and i'd never cried at a book in my life uh bawling 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 and when i went back and read the fiona of our tapestry a couple years later when i got to that third book i remember being lived in vancouver at the time and i was on the bus just like sobbing sobbing and i had to close it because i was sobbing too hard and then i got off the bus and sat at the gas station at night and just read this book and just bawled but so i read that as a teenager so that was probably pretty pretty formative see i had a i had a similar experience with the first time sci-fi elements were ever introduced to fantasy in a book i was reading which mm -hmm. i always thought was a terrible idea i was like no these need to be separate forever 
And I picked up a book that was like a guy from our planet, a person from the past, and someone from sci-fi all get thrown in this medieval world. And I was like, this is yeah. dumb. I don't like it. And then I, by the end of the book, I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> I need more of this. And now I'm seeing that there's sci-fi in quite a few well-known fantasy series. It's just either very subtly done or it's like a blink and you'll miss it kind of moment. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I've, I've definitely had a similar like, this is terrible. Oh, no, I need this in everything I experience. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, a good writer can make you buy in anything, I think. You don't think that's true until suddenly it becomes very apparent that, yeah, the, yeah. the certain – you know, it's the 10,000 hour principle where as soon as someone is just good enough at something, especially writing, they'll just make you buy into it no matter what. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it seems like you, Guy Gavril K, would you say that's your number one fantasy author? Is just someone you're all about? Yeah, I would say so. I'm pretty okay. like, like I, it, whenever he, I see him read, whenever he like in my, in my hometown, I'll go and, and, and see him watch or see him read. My holy relic is my editor's, uh, managed to get me a copy of his latest book before it came out. It's like on, on printer paper with the alignment dots still like on the pages. Uh, and so I had it so early and people were like, um, can I borrow it? And I was like, never, this thing is never leaving my house. Um, <laughs> and yeah. And I, so I read it and I thought it was probably too late for me to get a, like a, you know, a blurb in. not that I ever thought I could be a blurb on a guy, a real K cover, but I sent one anyway. And then sure enough, I am on that cover and, Oh, it is so more cool. important to me than any book I have. Like any of my books, don't care. That book, and then I'm also on a, the latest Joe Abercrombie one. So those two things, because you know those authors were so influential to me, the fact that my name is on one of their covers, it just blows me away. To me, that's cooler than seeing my name on my own cover. <laughs> just because, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have to, I have to make a confession. I have yet to read a Guy Gavril K book, but after okay, yeah. I'll do it. I'll do it. <laughs> Um, yeah. A lot of people have been yelling me for it too. I have uh, Tiga T Tigana right yeah, there. Yeah, Tigana's a good one. Yeah. So I definitely I'll pick that up soon. Um, yeah. It, there's there's certain authors that just handle certain aspects of the writing so well it almost becomes intimidating. Like I mm -hmm. I'm afraid to write after reading things like Rothfuss or Tolkien because I'm like, well, my prose are not that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just yeah. afraid. Um, yeah. And then yeah, you have to. This, it's the books that were so funny to me to see after Lord of the Rings was published. There's people who tried to like write the next Lord of the Rings in a year, and I'm like, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> no, no, yeah, no. It's hard, hard not to maybe emulate your favorite writers as you're when you're starting out. Maybe yeah. it takes a while to find your own voice. God knows, I yeah, emulated Guy Gabriel K, Stephen Erickson probably too. Malazan is an interesting series to get through. Um, I just finished yeah. Midnight Tides, and it's. Right when you feel like you're comfortable, he's like, by the way, we're on another continent now. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Again and again. And I'm like, man, where's Whiskey Jack? Just bring me back to Whiskey Jack. And oh, I'll yeah. Be happy. It's like, remember that character you thought was like the most powerful person on Earth? Someone just came along and flicked him like this and he hit the moon and died. He's dead yeah. now. Welcome to but the underworld. But by dead, I mean in the underworld. Yeah, he's back. He's coming back. Yeah, and Amanda Rake was the biggest thing. And now it's like, and here's the Elder Gods. So. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, those um, are great books. They, I, I appreciate and respect them so much. My enjoyment level, though, it fluctuates. Um, it, because mm -hmm. it, he, he's amazing when he's really getting into the character work and spending time there. I really dig it. And then there's mm -hmm. just gigantic chunks of the book that are world building, and I love world building. But for the third continent, it's like, let's take a deep breath. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think emul writer, like, emulating him would be a would be a you know kind of a rough go because he's just so freaking good at what he does no one else yeah. does it quite like him and i remember sometimes i'd read one of his books i'd be 80 pages in and i didn't know who the character was that i was reading from whose perspective it was and i'm like what is going on here and no one else can get away with that except for him yeah he, there's yeah he's just one of the people that's just like okay i'm the king of that and no one else can come touch it exactly you can do your exactly. attempt and we're done um just yeah. like you know, I'm not the largest fan of uh, um, King Killer, but you know, Rothfuss's prose, I just look at it and I'm like, oh, very few people are going to even touch what he's doing. And that's why, like, mm -hmm. I get why it's taking him so long to put out his next book because I'm sure he's going through line by line and just, okay, that's perfect. Next line. That's perfect. Next line. Yeah, I think with Rothfuss, and I've, I mean, I've never heard him say this or anything like that, but I mean, at least from my own perspective. Um, the whole reason I got into writing was like when I was reading that guy Gabriel K book about what you want to leave behind. Uh, so to me, it's not about putting out a book as fast as possible. Yeah. It's not about, 
making money off it. It's about putting out a piece of work that when people look back on it or your fan, your friends read it, they're like, this is okay. This is why you didn't hang out with me for two years. Like this is who you are, <laughs> part of who you are as a person. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, to me, every line, every sentence matters. And I, I will definitely, if I read through a whole book and don't turn over a corner or put a you know sticky thing in, um, if I don't see any beautiful prose, I probably won't read another book by that author. Yeah. Um, just cause that matters to me. I think, yeah, I do really appreciate Rothfuss's work just because he cares about every single sentence. Yeah. And, you know, if you are putting out a book or multiple books a year, to me, you're guaranteed to have a hit or miss scenario where you'll have like the Stephen King who will have a masterpiece, then he'll have three misfires and then he'll have his masterpiece. And mm -hmm. I still appreciate and love King to death. But it's kind of a, I think if he slowed down and suddenly was writing at a pace of a Martin, maybe we'd get more consistently just King masterpieces instead of, you know, the issue we have now. Yeah, but I mean, you certainly can't point and say that every author that works really quickly is bad because, my mm -hmm. God, like Mark, Mark Lawrence, he writes so quickly and yet he still manages this beautiful prose. Um, Chris, the author Christian Cameron, I love, you know, writes these amazing, like detailed books um, and he writes them quick. So just yeah. different strokes for different folks. Like, yeah, oh, it yeah. depends on the author. I, yeah, I didn't mean to insinuate. Yeah, Book of the Ancestors, oh, yeah. I burned through yeah. it was. Hmm. Yeah, I don't want to seem like that way either, but I mean, I, for myself, back in the day, there was a lot of authors that um, I've never expected a book to come out because I grew up on, like, reading Guy Gabriel K or J.R. Tolkien, where there was no book coming. Um, <laughs> it would be, I would kind of look for a new book every three years from that author. Mm -hmm. And a couple authors, um, I, I read their books and I loved them, and then I saw them, they started to write quicker, and I would read those books knowing that they wrote it quicker, and when I found mistakes in those books, I'd be more critical of them. Just, I mean, it's just something I couldn't help. Uh, and I just kind of stopped reading them because not everyone can write quickly and pull it off as good, I don't think. No. And I was mainly just trying to make the point of don't rush authors because I hate the fans who tweet at and yeah. comment. Like, you know, like you'll see Martin put up a post that's just like, I really like Chernobyl. And all the comments on it are like, why aren't you writing? And I'm like, maybe he's allowed to be a human being. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know I'm, I'm taking pretty long with my third book and it's been a rough go. Um, and yeah, I just, it's unexplainable sometimes how you're just not able to like be satisfied with what you're writing. Um, and you just want it to be the best it can be. So thankfully Especially. I've got editors that agree. Yeah. And I imagine, you know, once you find success, like you've found the pressure just feels all the more, it feels like I have to match not to, sorry, I don't mean to add on, <laughs> but I'm just, yeah, no. I'm sure now that you have the spotlight, you need to, you know, and keep the quality up there yeah to me it definitely feels now with the third book it's more personal i felt with bloody rose for sure um i was writing bloody rose right when kings of the wild started to like do well do pretty well um and yeah i would definitely i would when i found like a one-star review or a two-star review i would relish them because i was like here's somebody i can't disappoint <laughs> um, it really it really got into my head and i thought i was the most like down-to-earth person in the world but my God, I was so worried about disappointing not only like all, every, all your readers, but uh, but my editor, most importantly, uh, the person that took a chance on you and, and your publishers. You don't want to, to turn in a dud for your second book. So, yeah, I uh, I luckily have not experienced that yet. <laughs> um, so I, you're in this newer generation of fantasy authors that I find to be really shaken up the game. I mean, we have mm -hmm. everything from Ed Winter, who's bringing in this cultural dynamic we haven't seen before in his military fantasy. We have Poppy War doing this extreme examination of historical events. We have Kings of the Wild doing this satirical, respectful blend of fantasy. Are you looking to your peers right now and kind of like, where are you getting inspired from like the people around you? Or is it, no, I, you have your roots and you're just kind of going from there. Oh, definitely the people around me. Um, uh, and like I said, even that Alex White book, because it's a book about like friendship and camaraderie and, and you, uh, when I read things like that, it, you know, inspires me to like, I'm like, oh, I've got all these great characters. I got to get them out on the page so people can enjoy them the way I'm enjoying these characters. Mm -hmm. um, and I love all those books you mentioned. And yeah, I mean, they're all very, very different. Um, but like you said, like a diversity in, in reading material has definitely been amazing for fantasy for sure. Yeah, the, the gates are opening to just try weird stuff, and that's like the most exciting thing right now. Let's get weird. Yeah. Let's see what fantasy can do. Of course, a lot of it will fail, but that's yeah. fine. Um, yeah, and when you look at certain those things, like people always say, write what you love. Uh, maybe people think their idea is strange, um, but I mean, look at like Evan Winter's book is very personal to him. 
uh, and so is Rebecca Kwong's. Um, very personal, and mine is all ultimately personal to me. Um, and so I think ultimately, the, you know, every, take every bit of writing advice with a grain of salt. But yeah, write that book that's personal to you, and you think you're the only person in the world that's going to get it. And it turns out, lots of people will. Yeah, because I mean, the, we're all human, right? We can all relate. Maybe not what's maybe not empathize, but sympathize, which is the one where you mm-hmm. actually. Whichever. Um, yeah, know, empathize, so. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's that's really important because there's nothing that stands out more to me than reading a fantasy book than when it just feels like the author was trying to roll with the tide. Just be like, oh, this is just popular. I'll write that. Um, and mm-hmm. it just there's an inherent uh, lack of soul to it in a way that I feel like inevitably will come through. Mm-hmm. No, I agree. Um, well, if we're coming up on an hour here. I don't want to steal too, too much of your time. Apparently, it is your six-month anniversary. Congratulations, and thank Thanks. you so much for co- making time to come on the channel during that. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Yeah, well, and feel free to swing by and chat fantasy anytime. Um, where can people find you right now? Uh, I'm on Twitter uh, relatively regularly. I'm just Nicholas underscore Eames. Uh, I'm on Facebook, although I usually keep that just for less book stuff and more personal stuff. Um, and then Instagram. I like to think my Instagram is relatively entertaining. It's mostly like pictures of books set against a wood grain table or my cat or something. But Love it. Love it. Okay, well, thank yeah. you again for coming on. And everyone, if you have not checked out Kings of the Wild, it's one of my favorites from last year. And the sequel, Bloody Rose, will not disappoint at all all and i hope you have a great anniversary half halfway anniversary (laughs) yeah thanks